Well, here it is, 2014. You know, a lot of times we come to a new year, and, and I don't know about you, but I think, wow, maybe things are going to get better this year than they were last year. And at the same time, you know, that's what I said last year, too. And so kind of enter the new year with a lot of excitement about the possibilities and maybe, yeah, sometimes a little apprehension about, you know, what might happen. I guess that's natural. You know, I'm thinking after the last several years and the challenges to the country's economy that really affects all of us in some way or another. And this year, the, the whole health insurance and health care thing kind of being uncertain and, uh, you know, not to mention stuff going on abroad that can impact us back here in America. And, you know, you add to that natural disasters and then, of course, all your personal stuff, your family, your relationships, all that. I mean... Don't you think it'd be kind of understandable if uh, folks would begin 2014 with a little bit of trepidation? I don't know what 2014 will hold for us, but I do believe that we can make a right start in the new year. And that's the important part, to start well. So, for the next several Sundays, I plan to talk about starting the new year right. Now, I know most people, the new year thing and the whole concept and the theme of new year is long gone. That was way last, was that last week or the week before or whatever? Way, you know, way in the distant past. But here's how I look at it. You know, the year is 12 months. Three weeks of focusing on starting it right still gives us plenty of time to do it right for the next 12 months. And I kind of think it's still the new year until July. You know, that's the halfway point, and then we move on. So, for the next three Sundays, I want to focus on starting the new year right. I want to start here with this point here, iron shoes for rough roads. In the distant past, probably a thousand years before Christ, the Israelites, the people of Israel, led by Moses, fled slavery in Egypt, and wandered in the wilderness for a generation. They were headed for the promised land, that God was leading them to. And this story is told in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus and Deuter Deuteronomy. And so, as they're about to enter and take possession of the land that God had promised to their ancestor Abraham and all his descendants, so the children of Israel are all about ready to enter the promised land there, Moses pronounced a blessing on all of the tribes of Israel. Now, think about it. They've been wandering in the wilderness for generation. Prior to that, there were slaves in Egypt. And now they're about to go take possession of this land that God had laid out before them. And there's all kinds of challenges ahead of them. They got to think that there's some challenges. The unknown lay out there in front of them. And I'm thinking, though, though it was long ago, their situation really isn't so distant from ours as we enter a new year. So I want to focus on one of these blessings that Moses gave. This to the tribe of Asher. He said, the bolts of your gates will be iron and bronze and your strength will equal your days. That's the New International Version translation. But in the King James Version, it says it like this. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now, if you got one of the outlines to go with the sermon, you could underline thy shoes. Just underline that. Because that's what I want to focus on. The, the two translations there into the English are different because there is a Hebrew word involved here that can be translated in more than one way. The symbolism is slightly different, but the final meaning in either, either case is the same. The tribe of Asher, you see, was given land along the coast north of modern-day Haifa, Israel, extending into what we know as southern Lebanon. It was very fruitful and productive land, a highly favored place. It wasn't desert. It was productive. But it was also mountainous and a place of potential great danger, not only because of the mountains, but because there was a main highway running up and down the coast there where invading armies often traveled, actually. Iron and brass bolts on gates. That would be pretty necessary for protection from attack. Or if it's iron brass for shoes that would have to march out on rough roads to meet enemies. The people who live in hilly terrain or must walk through un 
paved places need good shoes or boots. They're a necessity. You know, I, I love my Vibram lug soled hunting boots. I feel like when I'm wearing those, I can walk over or through just about anything. If you're a runner or a jogger, you know that shoes make all the difference in your performance and protection for your feet. Some of you travel by air, you know, take flights someplace around the country, and these days you think about wearing comfortable walking shoes, don't you? when you travel by air. Sounds like an oxymoron. Put on your walking shoes when you go travel by air, but think of the long terminals you gotta walk through and standing in line. As they prepared to enter this new land that God had promised those Israelites, shoes of iron for the roads ahead were necessary. Each new year is a beginning of a new journey, really, how will we fare? What will the road be like? Will our way be rough or easy? Now, if the, if the way is going to be flower-strewn, then velvet slippers will do. If all we're going to do in 2014 is watch TV, we don't need iron shoes. Thick socks will do just fine. But if we tra plan to travel rough roads... We need good footwear. And I believe that I, I believe in 2014 we can count on a couple of things. The first thing is I'm pretty sure that all of us here this morning will walk on rocky roads before the year is done. For some, it will be challenges of family or health or finances or even faith in God. For, for all of us together, all of us together as God's family, called to fulfill this mission of bringing people to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. For all of us together, there's going to be tough times as we struggle to share the gospel with younger generations, people outside of our own personal circles, and to, to help all of us grow toward maturity in Christ. You know, growing to maturity in Christ is not the same as growing older in your body, Christy, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Even though I'm way older than you are, I'm still growing in maturity in Christ. That's an important part of it. You know, there's really no use for silk slippers on the road to heaven because actually the road is pretty hard and the way is difficult and the path sometimes tre treacherous because it's not the easy place to get to. The easy place to get to is just like, you know, water going with the flow, always end up at the lowest point. We will need iron shoes, just like the coaches say. No pain, no gain. No guts, no glory. No struggle, no growth. So I'm pretty sure all of us are going to go through some tough times, especially if we decide to follow Jesus. We're going to need our iron shoes. Second thing I'm pretty sure about 2014 is God's great promises of old still stand. For those who trust in the Lord, your shoes will be of iron and brass because God knows what struggles we face. In our personal lives, we always face struggles. But do you realize that God has called you and me to also be with him in the struggle against evil and human sin? Did you get that part? Not only is God there for you for your own personal struggles, God is there calling you to be part of his struggle against evil and sin. God, You see, God wants each of us to do our part to grow in grace and to bring others to his grace. How are you doing on those two things? Growing in grace and bringing others to grace. A lot of folks get started on the growing in grace and they forget about the other part, bringing others to God's grace. Are you in a small group? We talked about that earlier today, a small group. That's the best place for this to happen, those two things, to grow in grace and bring others to God's grace. When you're with other believers studying the word, reflecting on the word, sharing the, your own struggles, it's like iron sharpening iron. You get better. 
You grow in grace. And that's also the safest place to invite somebody else who's not in your circle to come to God's grace. They're in a comfortable setting with a small group. As we start the new year, we can take strength in God's word for us. And that is the living word of Jesus himself, Emmanuel, God with us, whom we celebrate at Christmas. Now, speaking of Christmas, okay, so it's been, what, almost three weeks since Christmas? Anybody even remember Christmas 2013? Huh? It goes by so quickly, doesn't it? So many of you know the true meaning of Christmas, right? It's all about getting gifts, right? No? Okay. It's all about warm feelings during the holiday. No. What's Christmas all about? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. It's all about Jesus, but you knew that was the answer. But even more than that, even more than that, Christmas is about an important Christian doctrine. Now, don't be afraid of that word doctrine. It simply means basic belief, foundational belief. It's an important thing to build faith on. Christmas is about an important Christian doctrine, the doctrine of incarnation. That means God coming in human form, taking on the flesh and blood of humanity, becoming one of us. Now, from a distance, maybe you're pretty nonchalant about incarnation because you're used to hearing this at Christmas time, of course. God in flesh appearing, you know, God with us, all that kind of stuff. Oh, it's no big deal. For many people, non believers, Jews, Muslims, this idea of God in the flesh is preposterous. As preposterous as resurrection. How could a holy God possibly defile himself as an unholy human? But Christians know that God did enter history as a holy human in Jesus of Nazareth. And that event makes a world of difference in our living. Doctrines like the Incarnation matter in our daily lives, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we talk about it or not, they make a difference in our lives. God, now in flesh appearing, came in the midst of a violent, messy, mysterious, and wonderful world. And the incarnation means at least two important things to us in our messy, violent, mysterious, and wonderful world. First thing, the incarnation is God's reaffirmation of the original goodness of the flesh and bone creatures he created so long ago. You know the story. It's in Genesis, first three chapters. God created heavens and earth and everything on the earth, and he said, it's good, and it was all good. Humans created in God's image were originally good until they decided they didn't need God anymore, and they fell from God's grace or stepped out of God's grace, and sin entered the world in our lives. We know that. But the incarnation is a reaffirmation of that original goodness. God said, I originally made you to be good in my image, and I'm still going to see it happen. Second thing that the incarnation tells us, his love is so deep for his earthly fallen beings that he willed through Jesus to redeem us body and soul. Body and soul. Not just soul, but body and soul. You know, it's, it's really a source of comfort and hope to me to know that God still loves you and still loves me and seeks to redeem us even while we're slogging through our trials and tribulations. Our redemption, you see, isn't a simple magical deliverance from our struggles. Jesus doesn't like extract us from the messy business of life. You know, wouldn't it be great? Well, you get saved, uh, Jesus is your Savior, and then... From then on out, life is smooth sailing, right? But it doesn't work that way. In fact, if you're serious about following Jesus, sometimes the sailing gets rougher because you're going against the grain of the world. He doesn't just pull us out of the messy business of life. Rather, here's the good news. The good news of the incarnation is that we are being redeemed in the midst of it all. 
St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians says, to, to the unbelievers, the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God. Being saved. The incarnation tells us that this flesh and blood life of ours has meaning and purpose because it's through that flesh and blood life of ours that we are being redeemed. Each day has a purpose. You know, in a culture that so often manages to simultaneously idealize and trivialize the human body, the wonder of the incarnation has never been more important than now. For the elderly who sense that their bodies are failing them. Christy, quit looking at me when I say that. <laughs> I'm feeling fine. For the teenagers who are bombarded with conflicting messages about their bodies. For new parents who marvel at the, the creation of new life in the uniting of their bodies. God, now in flesh appearing, is God's reaffirmation that we are created in his image, that he wills to redeem us body and soul, and he will raise us up body and soul. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, the Psalms say, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. I don't know about you, but that, that understanding of the incarnation gives me confidence to enter the unknown territory of 2014, knowing that each day has a purpose. No one knows what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, and he's already been there to the future, and he's already been here in what we live through as well. So that brings us to the last part of this verse in Deuteronomy that I want to look at. It's, it's a promise, really, of great provision. It says, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Note that it does... It says days, not day. Plural. There's three notes of hope I think we can find in this verse. First one is, God will give strength for each and every day in the year ahead. Not just that one special day, but each and every day in the year ahead. God will give strength. Number two, God will give strength for every kind of day. Not just certain days, not when you're holy, not when you've read your Bible, but every kind of day that we may face. You know, some days are filled with joy, right? Some days are filled with light and happiness. Others, not so much. Sadness, tears, frustration, pain, heartache, anger, frustration. God gives strength enough to meet all. All of them, every kind of day. Third thing, God will give strength to all of our days until the end of our days. We're going to run out of days before we run out of God's strength. Will you have hard days in 2014? Fear not. Your strength will equal your days. Will you have days of sickness in 2014? Fear not. Your strength will equal your days. Will you have days of doubt and confusion in 2014? Fear not. Your strength will equal your days. Think about your three greatest worries about 2014. What things occupy your mind and heart in these opening days of the year? As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Means that no matter what happens, God's strength will always equal the days that are ahead. God's strength will be there when you need it and not before. It'll be sufficient for your needs and no more. In happy days filled with sunlight, 
We may not need much of God's strength, but when hard times come, we will find that the divine reservoir is more than enough to meet our needs. Part of the secret of this is that he's way ahead of us. It would be enough if God simply walked with you through the events of life. But he does more than that. While you're slogging your way through this week, God is already in February stockpiling the strength you're going to need when you get there. While you're living in Tuesday, he's clearing the road for you on Friday. Are you worried about next week? Or this week coming ahead, starting tomorrow? Are you worried about that? Don't sweat it. He's already there. Do you have any concerns about June or September? God's already there. What about that crucial meeting next week? Sleep well. He's already there. What about that tough decision that looms ahead of you? Fear not, he's already there. God's already at work providing solutions for problems you don't even know you have yet. And remember, just as God provided for those ancient Israelites as they wandered through the desert, God will also provide for you when you need it. Just think about who it is that promises us such a blessing. As thy day, so shall your strength be. He's the one who, who created us. He called his creation good, and he still loves us. He's the one who appoints our days, who has loved us from eternity, and whose resources are unlimited, who came in the flesh to redeem us from our own mess of sin. If such a God has made such a promise, we can be sure that he will keep his promise. Here's some practical takeaways from this verse, I think. Take each day as it comes. Don't try to force the future. Let God lead. That means you might have to listen a little bit, huh? Do each day what God gives you to do. Connect with God each day through Scripture and prayer. I probably should have put that one first. Connect with God each day through Scripture and prayer so that you could start listening so God could lead you and you could do what God gives you to do that day. Rejoice in the Lord always. Blessed be your name on the days when the sun shines and in the darkness. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, and you're going to have some days you go through some stuff, and all you can say is, Hallelujah, anyhow. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always, and run to the cross. When the stresses start piling up, run to the cross. God will not put you in an unbearable situation in 2014. But you may find yourself in a situation that seems unbearable, and sometimes you're there because you chose it. You didn't think so at the time, but there you are. Sometimes you may find yourself in a situation that seems unbearable. That's when God will be there for you, if you will turn to him. See, God wants us to be like him. He doesn't force himself upon us. He waits for us to ask for his strength. Turn to him. Christ's feet were pierced with iron nails that we might have iron shoes for the road. We can't succeed this year without Christ, but with him by our side, we can face anything with confidence and joy. I know I sound like a broken record, repeating the same thing over and over again. But I, but I have to keep telling the truth. Jesus walks beside you as you provide space for him in your life. Are you making room for him to walk beside you? You know, some people get all upset. Some Christians get all upset and say, how come God's strength isn't there when I need it? And they haven't been making room for him. Don't wait until you're in real big trouble to call on him. Our rough days can add up and build up to an insurmountable problem. It's always better to call on him today so that the small challenges don't become really big ones. 
The best way to provide room for him is a daily dose of the Bible. You know, the reason we did that all-church study last year in Lent, 40 days in the Word, the reason we did that is to help people develop the discipline of going to the Bible every single day, reading, studying, reflecting on the Bible, a daily dose of Scripture to guide you in the path ahead. And parents, you know, that, that's one of the reasons it's so important that your kids are consistent at Awana on Wednesday nights or Forge, the youth group on Wednesday night, or Kids Church on Sunday morning, so that they learn those Bible verses that carry them through life. The law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. And then add to that, the daily dose of Scripture, add to that some prayer time. Have I said that before up here from this pulpit ever? You know, prayer time added to the Scripture. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. Pray about your daily routine and your challenges. The night before or in the morning when you get up, start a conversation with God while you're driving. It's okay. Other people are texting. Oh, by the way, I forgot that. At our 830 service, we had an, uh, an attorney here. He's a member of our congregation, and he was the liturgist. And he said, we all know that texting and driving is against the law. It's also against the law to text during the sermon. So he said that. I didn't, you know, I'm just, <laughs> just, I'm just passing that along. So start a conversation with God. Then get in a small group where you can grow in his grace with the support of other believers. You know, a lot of times, God's strength for you is provided through those other believers that you fellowship with in a small group. That's often where you find it. And that's God's intentions. That's what it means. You know, the daily dose of scripture, the daily prayer, getting in a small group with other believers, that's what it means to put on the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. When the going gets tough, the tough have the full armor of God to wear and the backing of Jesus Christ himself. So if you're tired of your sin, turn to him. If you want a new start in life, turn to him. If you need hope and encouragement, turn to him. If you want Jesus' strength, you got to turn to him. The captain of our salvation has called us to join his army. And brothers and sisters, it's time to put on those iron shoes because the day of March has come and the only way we can go is forward. May God help us to press on to know and to serve our Lord in 2014. Now, in closing, will you say this verse with me? It's from Deuteronomy 33, verse 25. Let's say it. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Deuteronomy 33, 25. Amen.